The success that director Christopher Nolan has achieved over his career has enabled him to constantly scale up the production of each film that he shoots. From his self-financed first film, Following, which he made for $6,000, up to blockbusters like Inception with a budget of $160 million, he's seen an exponential increase in the filmmaking resources available to him. In this video, I'll take a look at the effect that the production budget has had on three of his films, focusing on how access to money affects the cinematography and storytelling in each film. I'll break down how a film budget is assigned and analyze the production of Following, Memento and Inception to see what impact each film's budget has on how they were constructed. To provide some context, a film budget refers to the total money required to produce a feature film. A document breaking down this list of expenses is commonly compiled early in the production process and is used as a reference for the required financing to make the movie. Film budgets are traditionally divided into four segments, above the line, below the line, post-production and other costs. Above the line articles in a budget refer to the expenses of the individuals who influence the creative direction of the movie, such as the screenwriter, the director and actors, although I'd argue that they are not the only members with creative input in a film. Typically, a disproportionate part of the budget is allocated to these individuals. In many cases, the above the line budget can even be the largest component of the total budget. Below the line refers to the rest of the production costs and payment of technical crew members. The term comes from the early studio days where there would be a physical line in the budget separating the above the line and below the line costs. Post-production costs occur after principal photography and include items such as the music, VFX work and editing. Other costs are additional items such as insurance that don't fit elsewhere in the budget. Depending on the film, more or less money will be allocated to each section. For example, some films may choose to allocate more money to star power, while others save their money for VFX in post-production. As is the case with many low-budget first films, in following Nolan's first film which he funded himself, most of the money went towards the below-the-line production costs namely the cost of purchasing film stock and processing it. As such, he structured the story of the film around his monetary limitations, which he kept in mind while he was writing the script. He didn't have much control over the color palette of the locations or production design, and therefore chose to shoot with black and white 16mm film. Not only was it far cheaper than shooting in 35mm color, but it also eliminated the need for him to balance the color temperature of the lights. This meant he eliminated the variable of color temperature and only had to focus on lighting with contrast. Shooting in black and white also gave the film a built-in expressionist style, with the 16mm film grain giving the image a gritty look which worked for this dark, character-driven story. Due to the limited film stock they could buy, Nolan adopted an approach of thoroughly rehearsing with actors, getting the performances where he wanted them, before only then rolling on a tape or two with a precious film. This perceived limitation can often be a blessing for young directors, as it forces them to have a clear idea of exactly what they need from each scene before they roll on a frame. The lights on the shoot were limited to a kit of three redheads, 800 watt tungsten lights, and sometimes a blonde, a more powerful 2000 watt lamp. We'd light the whole set with three or four lights and do it very quickly and adopt a documentary style. We'd look at the natural lighting of the situation we were in and you'd try to enhance or exaggerate that to the degree you needed to get the correct exposure. Nolan notes that the same basic lighting philosophy of supplementing the naturally occurring light was carried over by DP Wally Pfister in their later films together. They may have had lighting trucks worth of gear on these bigger films rather than just a redhead kit, but the lighting principle of creating what Nolan refers to as heightened naturalism remained the same. One way to achieve exposure with beautiful, naturalistic lighting full of contrast from a single light source is to place characters next to windows, which he did throughout following. 
following was shot in an Ariflex 16BL and a more compact wind-up 16mm Bolex for the handheld street scenes. Nolan mainly utilized spherical prime lenses, however he did occasionally use a zoom. He prefers primes as they require you to physically move the camera closer in order to get a tighter shot. This direct connection made him carefully consider his lens choices and the emotional effect they had on the story, rather than just putting the camera down and zooming in or out to get a frame. The first scene in the film was shot of a dolly in a more controlled style. This meant that later, when he went handheld for the rest of the film, the camera movement would appear to be a deliberate choice rather than a limitation. Following, which features minimal locations and characters, a running time of only 69 minutes and was shot in an easy to set up documentary style, is a good lesson in how to craft a contained, low budget film that embraces and is structured by its limitations. When I went into making bigger films, I had to hire a director of photography for the first time. For me, there was a great deal of concern because all of my filmmaking to that point had been me with a camera directing through the lens. The DP that Nolan chose to hire was Wally Pfister, who took many of the cinematic principles Nolan employed in following and used the increased budget to elevate them in telling a larger story which was still relatively contained. Due to the increased control that comes from shooting with a larger budget, Memento had more precise cinematography than Nolan's first film, but was based in a similarly clinical style. It's funny because people look at following and they look at Memento and in a way they're different visually, but to me they're very similar because I shot following in a very precise way. The frame is very precise and Memento is the same way in a different format and I feel like what we did with following is we tried to push the filmmaking to as high a technical standard as we could with what we had, which was basically nothing. More budget for production costs meant that he could shoot on the format that he wanted to, light for color and pay for access to specific locations which they scouted. They shot on a mix of 35mm color film stocks from Kodak, 250D for day scenes and 200T and 500T for interior or night scenes. Scenes on a different timeline were shot in 5222 black and white to differentiate them visually. An increased camera budget also meant that they could shoot on more expensive Panavision E-series anamorphic lenses and pay a camera crew to run them. The lenses provided a widescreen aspect ratio which at the time had associations with being more cinematic and grander than the older academy aspect ratio. Fister notes that Nolan liked the perspective of shooting on longer anamorphic lenses and as such we shot almost all of Memento and Insomnia on a 75mm E-series lens. Part of this lens choice came from trying to create a subjective point of view. What we tried to do in Memento is simply block the film from the character's point of view as much as possible. So he walked into a room, you're kind of looking over his shoulder, you're exploring the room as he does and you're always at his eye line. the camera's always a little bit closer to him. Having a larger budget meant that they could afford a dolly and a grip team. This meant smooth, precise camera movement could be built into all the shots which required it, rather than just the first scene in the film. Also, I imagine far more money was spent on above the line items in Memento, such as paying for well-known lead actor Guy Pearce. Although budgeting for well-known actors may be expensive, Having big names starring in a film usually leads to increased box office sales, making above the line spending a bit of an investment. Despite the $9 million budget, Nolan was still faced with limitations. They only had 25 days for principal photography, which is a very short window to shoot this kind of film. Yet he was able to use his elevated production budget to increase his control over the format through using more expensive technical gear hire a full crew to run the gear and streamline production, and hire well-known actors that would draw more people to watch the film. Stepping it up even further, Inception is a $160 million big budget film which expanded the scope of Nolan's storytelling to blockbuster proportions with principal photography 
taking place in premium locations in six different countries. All aspects of spending in the budget were vastly increased, from a big cast of famous names on screen to below the line spending on the production budget and plenty of VFX work in post-production. If we compare the camera and electrical departments on the three films as an example, it's easy to see which movie would have had higher crew costs. As a rule of thumb, larger sets, more complex camera movement and bigger scope set pieces require more specialized technical crew members to execute. Despite a far larger and more technically complex story, Nolan still applied some basic lessons from following to the cinematography of Inception. Once again, the lighting approach was one of enhancing the naturally occurring sources on the set, although this time it meant using 20Ks instead of redheads to illuminate larger spaces. Like following, they shot almost all of the film using a single camera, only pulling out additional cameras for complex stunt sequences where repeat performances were very expensive and difficult. Even on such a large film, Nolan didn't want to shoot with a second unit for stunt scenes as he wanted to maintain control over every frame in the film. They also dedicated more money to the capture format than Memento, shooting on a mix of 35mm anamorphic, the pricier 65mm film, and VistaVision for aerials. For scenes which required high-speed photography, Vista employed a 35mm Photosonics 4C camera, which could shoot up to 2,500 frames per second to create super slow, dreamlike visuals. A lot of the camera budget was also allocated to a variety of more expensive grip rigs. Like on Memento, they used a dolly, as well as a Steadicam, a helicopter, an arm car, and a Technocrane. In a scene where a hotel passageway begins to rotate and characters run around on the walls and ceiling, a set was constructed in a studio and the camera was mounted on a stabilized head attached to a Technocrane which could move around the space as required. Nolan used his blockbuster budget on Inception to shoot in various locations around the world with a star-studded cast and a bloated technical crew, access whatever technical gear was required, put lots of money into huge sets and stunt sequences, and pay for a post-production intensive finishing of the film. Christopher Nolan is an excellent example of a director who uses story as a way of controlling the required budget. From his earlier films, where he had less access to money, he carefully structured the narrative by only writing screenplays that he had the capacity to shoot and project on screen. From $6,000 69-minute following to $160 million 148-minute long Inception. As he increased in experience and was given access to larger budgets, he expanded the scope of his scripts progressively telling larger and larger stories, which still utilized the core principles of cinematography and filmmaking which he'd learned from his earliest film, such as creating a heightened naturalism through lighting, trying to always shoot with a single camera, using prime lenses whenever possible, moving the camera in a considered way, only writing films he had the capacity and budget to tell, and, importantly, always having a clear vision for how the film will look and feel before beginning production or rolling on the first take. Thanks everyone for the continued support. As always, liking, subscribing, commenting or supporting on Patreon would greatly help the channel. Until next time, thanks for watching and goodbye.